communication affecting people with words. Here's one that's a challenge, learning to identify with whoever you're talking to, whether it's a group or an individual. Identification simply means build a bridge between you and someone else so that the conversation flows easy, so that you try to do your best to understand where each other is coming from. Identification means start with something real. If you're married and have a family and you talk to someone who's married and has a family, that's an easy identification. <clears throat> I'm married, you're married, I've got children, you've got children. What gets to be a little more complicated now is I'm a man, you're a woman. Yes. Now, if we both have children, we would have that in common. If we both worked at the local department store, we might have that in common to talk about as a start. But then, finally, for the man and the woman, it gets a little more complicated. Expectations, demands, all that. Man gets married, hands his wife this list of 12 positions he wants her to fill eventually. Mother, you know, lover, chauffeur, a housekeeper, cook, teacher, guardian, just to name a few. She says, whoa, that's pretty heavy. And then he's got his own challenge. She says to him, go conquer the world and be home by five o'clock. <laughs> and he says, whoa, whoa. So working this thing out, right, between man and woman, male and female, brother and sister, it's a challenge. But it was meant, right, for the combination to be extraordinary. Here's what happens in the combination. Uh, you multiply the effect by 2, by 3, by 5, by 10. So make this note, it says. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing is impossible. That's a good communication challenge. If two or three agree on a common purpose, nothing's impossible. The most extraordinary things are possible. If just two or three agree, See, the challenge is the two or three to agree. And this is where identifying, could we identify a common, could we identify a common purpose? Could we identify a common reason and get together and blend our resources together? My time, your time put together might be extraordinary time. In this case now, one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one could equal 10, the power of 10. Old Testament, there's a unique phrase that says, one can become so power, powerful they can put a thousand to flight, cause a thousand to flee. If two get together, they can cause 10,000 to flee. Giving us that idea that one plus one in terms of potential power in blending talents and skills and purpose could multiply the power not by two, but by 10. That's why extraordinary partnerships, right, can produce some of the most colossal productivity and activity and business structure and all kinds of unique things. Two together. It doesn't take that many, right? Jesus only had 12. So it doesn't take 2,000. If a few say, let's conquer the world. If a few say, we could do something extraordinary, your talent plus mine, Maybe another one or two. See, just a few with common interest, common power. But the whole key is you start that potential by building a bridge of understanding each other, identification. Okay. Here's a big challenge. If, if, if the adult is 40 and the child is 12, see, that's a heck of a bridge to build between 40 and 12. How do you identify? Here's one of the best ways. Remember when you were 12 and talk about that. I remember 12. I remember almost every day of being 12. One of the problems of being 12 is you're not 13. <laughs> I mean, the teenagers go away. They do some, you know, fun things. They're gone. 
If I heard it once, I heard it a hundred times. You're only 12. I said, wow, I'm stuck here. It's like being stuck. Finally, finally, I turned 13. See, kids will understand that. Being 12, wishing you were 13. Did you ever get chosen last? They're choosing up sides. The leaders are choosing up sides. I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you. You're standing there, standing there. I'll take you, I'll take you. Finally, the last one says, I guess I'll have to take you. <laughs> Guess what? Those stories will identify with kids, disappointments, right? Misunderstandings. I thought they said, sure enough, that's not what they really said. Wow, and I got in trouble. Kids will understand that. This is called identification, finding some common ground in which to communicate. Okay, that's important. Here's the next one in communication. That is attacking the problem without attacking the person. Here's where language must be careful when you're dealing with challenges of this nature. Sometimes you've got to put love and hate in the same sentence so that there's no misunderstanding. God said, I love you, but I hate your sinful ways. Now, I, sometimes it seems to me like Man, maybe God hates me. He said, no, no, let me make it clear one more time. I love you, but I hate your sinful ways. Sometimes as parents, we've got to do that. Put love and hate in the same sentence. I love you, but I hate what's happening. I love you, but I hate the direction you've chosen. I love you, but I hate the situation you've gotten into. Kids need to know what you love and what you hate. Because it takes both. The old prophet said what? We must love good and hate evil. The evil that would destroy us, the mistakes that would do us in, the miscalculation that would ruin our reputation and leave us helpless. Wow, what good benefit somebody brings to us to help point out some of those even very sensitive things to go after the problem. But hopefully they go after the problem, but they have this sincere desire to truly help. Now, sometimes you can get careless in language and you, you mean to help, but you said it wrong. What if you meant to say, what's troubling you? And instead you said, what's wrong with you? See, that's an error in language that can cause all kinds of difficulty. You meant to say, what's troubling you? And instead you said, what's wrong with you? Now, we'll let you make that mistake 10 years ago, but 10 years later, to be making the same error in language? See, we need to understand that. Say, no, I need to learn to say it better so that it sets up a better chance for communication. It sets up a better chance for me to talk about something constructive and not come out with something wrong, saying it wrong, correct all those errors in verbal judgment. Here's a good way to go after the problem. Go after the problem that you've had. We call this third party. Say, so, you know, Mary, I was in this same fix. I thought this, and it turned out to be this. I made a mistake and misunderstood. Sure enough, I'm headed down the wrong road. About a year later, I'm in serious trouble. I finally worked my way out. But I'm telling you, you can save yourself that kind of calamity with just a couple of words of advice. Use yourself as part of the problem. Say, I was the problem at one time. I gave people grief when I should have given them thanks. And it created for me no value. Right? It's called attacking the problem in yourself. Then here's another way. Third party. Where you say, I know someone who miscalculated. And if they were here, here's what they would say with tears. Don't go down this road. Remember that movie years and years ago called, called Scared Straight? Where they went, they took some kids into prison and let them interview and talk to the prisoners. And the prisoner said, you don't want to come here. Let me take you on a tour, show you what it's like. 
And the kids came out of the prison with eyes about this big saying, whoa, the man said I shouldn't come here. See, that kind of advice, straight talk, can be so helpful if it's done in the right manner and in the right way. In building your house on the rock instead of on the sand, how do you decide to build on the rock? You have somebody give you the image that they built on the sand and suffered the disaster of a storm. Because sometimes when the, when the day is unique and the sky is blue and the clouds are fleecy white, it's easy to be faked out and build on the sand. There doesn't seem to be any immediate consequences. Somebody says, no, the storms, the storms. And if you've never had one of those storms, you would say, what storms? So let me tell you about the storms. And then you need somebody to scare you to death about the potential of the upcoming storm so that you don't make the mistake and be deluded when the days are nice to build your house on the sand. Isn't that a challenge? The answer is yes, that's a challenge, but that's life. That's the deal. How often does winter follow fall? Every year. Years ago, I did a series of lectures for Chevron dealers and their management all over America, even up in Alaska and over in Hawaii. When I first started giving them this series of lectures, the management and uh, some of the leaders of the Chevron uh, Corporation called me in and we had a nice talk. And they said, well, first of all, Mr. Rome, we'd like to get acquainted. And uh, we've heard about your presentation and we think you might be able to share some good ideas. And they said, by the way, you travel the world and Right, You know a lot of corporate executives, and you've been in business for a long time all around the world. They asked me, what do you think the next 10 years are going to be like? And I said to them, gentlemen, you have asked the right person. So their eyes lit up. I said, I do have experience. I have traveled the world, and I've lived a long time, and I really know the deal. And here's how the next 10 years are going to be. About like the last 10 Winter follows fall, some are easy and some are hard, some are difficult and some are simple, and then spring follows winter. It, for how many years now? 6,000 years of recorded history. So it isn't going to change. And sometimes an individual needs to hear this, and you need to communicate it well. Use every story you can to communicate it. Now, here's another part of communication, and that is solutions. Solutions. Solutions usually involve, by communication, being able to take somebody from the present. For sometimes we take someone back to review their mistakes. So jot down this little setup here now. Sometimes first, to help someone, we take them back and examine the errors that brought them to a poor place. Errors in judgment, errors in health judgment, errors in career judgment, errors in personal judgment. So sometimes we have to take someone back, and sometimes that's difficult to go back over those times that were difficult. Then here's the next challenge, bring them to the present. Hey, here's how it is now. Guess what now always is? The greatest of hope and the greatest of possibilities is now. If you will begin now to amend those errors in judgment, if you begin now to construct a new destination and thereby a new direction, because direction determines destination, if you'll reconstruct now, starting now. So we give them the sense of the past errors that might bring tears, that might bring sadness, that might bring this cloud for a while. Wow. Yes, that's how it was. Yes, that's where I made my mistake. But here now, now is like spring. Now is a new opportunity. And then we describe the now and the opportunity. But here's what's best, is to be able to transport someone into the future. With their problems solved, with money in the bank, with their health restored. You can't restore your health overnight. So you've got to take someone into the future. 
In just a few months, you'll notice the difference. In the first year, it'll be incredible. By the end of the third year, I promise you, such an abundance of this or this or this change or this change, this kind of productivity, this kind of activity breeds this kind of productivity. Take somebody on a journey back, show them the present called opportunity, and then take them on a journey into the future. We must do that with our children. What if you inspired your salespeople and not your child? What if you took the people around you into the future, but not your family, to describe to them the possibilities that if we work together, we can have the most extraordinary family ever, benefiting each other, drawing strength from each other. And here's how it can be. Here's how it's going to be. So make this note. The promise of the future is an awesome force. In the future, problems can be solved. In the future, fortunes can be won. In the future, productivity can be incredible. So be able to paint the past and the present and the future. This is one of the most awesome challenges of communication. Here's one of the best ways to inspire someone else. Help them to see themselves better than they are. Sometimes we have to help people see themselves as they are. If your child is messed up, you got to say, hey, John, you have messed up. But here's the next clue, parents. Don't leave them in the mess. So they've messed up. How quickly could they turn it around? Almost overnight. What could be the promise of the future if they started walking a new road? Absolutely colossal and unbelievable. So we quickly go from saying, yes, you've messed up, no doubt about that. But here's how quickly you can recover. Here's how quickly you can multiply the future in a positive way versus the negative way that brought you to this poor place. See, the gift of language can do the most incredible things with a human being. Rescue them from oblivion. Send them into the future with a, a picture of the promise, the possibilities. Don't be lazy in exercising these gifts. Someone say, well, how good do we, do we need to be at it? As good as you possibly can. Someone says, well, this is only a child. What a better place to start. Correcting a few errors and building the promise of the future. We can't say it's only a child. This could be the next superstar. This could be the next person of high productivity that starts enterprises that employs millions. This next child, this child. Properly corrected, properly inspired. The promise of the future is an awesome force. My mentor worked this on me. He said, Jim Rohn, if you keep up these disciplines and if you keep up these skills, keep increasing productivity, learn how to work with people, do the job well, do the activity, learn to teach. He said, I promise you, you're going to have a unique place. I promise you. He kept saying that. I promise you. Things will all change. I promise you. A bank full of money. I promise you. A heart full of gratitude. I promise you. A family with unusual respect. I promise you. An audience that won't quit. And he just kept saying all of this stuff. I promise you. Take it from me. I've got the experience. I know. Person like you. Your dedication. If you keep up this pace, the day will come. The day will come. And he painted this picture. I couldn't sleep nights the first year. Then I remember one day he said, one of these days, you'll walk into a room full of people. And as you walk in the room, you'll hear someone say, that's him. That's the famous man. I thought, well, that could never happen to me. I was raised in obscurity, right? One of my first skills was milking cows. I mean, what's that got to do with walking in a room and have someone say, that's him. That's the man, the famous man. But sure enough, year by year, audience by audience and book by book, as I traveled this journey, wow, that promise from this man started coming true. I think when I got here today, even before I reached this auditorium, I think I heard someone say, that's him. That's the famous man. <laughs> Whoa. I just wish my mentor, Mr. Schof, was here to see this. Here's what he would say. I told you. I said, listen to what they're saying. I told you, I 
told you. Yeah, that's right. It's happening. Whoa. I wonder how much further. I wonder how much more. Wow. That's a gift. Language that transports people into the future. Jesus used it as an incredible incentive. He said to his little group, we're going to have a tough time and be a bit misunderstood. This is a new thing we got going here. Some people are going to like it and some people are not going to like it. And, you know, the devils are after us and all the rest of the stuff that started this trauma way back in the beginning for the beginnings. It, it hasn't changed. But we've got such a splendid idea. It's worth working. I've been with you now three and a half years. And here's the deal. Let's now go tell the story. Tell the story to someone else. And they said, okay. So they start telling the story. Sure enough, they run into challenges. Sure enough, the devil is at work. And I'm sure Jesus said to them, if we do the work well, I promise you when all of this is finished, in my Father's house are many mansions. See, that's clever. He put the mansion shot on them. No wonder they walked the streets and told the story, fought the devils and fought the opposition. No wonder. But I'm sure they came back to Jesus every once in a while and said, would you tell us about the mansions one more time? <laughs> We've had a really tough day. So you got to do that with your children. You got to dazzle them. Take dazzling lessons. I don't know where you sign up in Anaheim for dazzling lessons, but why not? As a grandfather, I wanted to be a five-star grandfather. I'm on my way, dazzling my grandchildren. So I'm asking you to do the same thing with your company, with your people that work for you, and especially your family, so that you can give them the promise of the future. They'll do extraordinary things if they can see. If they can't see, they'll take little steps. If they can see, they'll take giant steps. Solution. Money solution, business solutions, solutions of every description. Be a person with a ready solution. Now make this list. To become a good persuader of people to change their ways, people to change, people to grow, or even persuading somebody to buy or to participate in the art of persuasion, here is the deal. Number one. Become a good storyteller. And the way to become a good storyteller is to gather up stories, testimonials. I mentioned earlier today, Sarah Alfaro, single mother, four children, no job, no home, no car, no money. With $1 investment now makes $40,000 a month. She's a superstar mother in Mexico. What a story. How did she do it? She's asked now to travel not only in Mexico, but other countries around the world to tell her.
extraordinary story. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Learn some of those stories of people who started with nothing, people who started behind and made it work, people that had no money but had courage. If you got enough courage, you don't need much money. Sarah had so much courage, she only needed a dollar. If you've got enough courage, that's all you need is a little seed, something. Here's all you need if you've got enough courage, a chance. You don't need a promise. You don't need a guarantee. If you've got enough courage, all you need is a chance. Wow. Stories, teenage stories. If you're talking to a teenager, just gather up some more teenage stories. Teenagers in trouble, in trouble now set free. Teenagers that couldn't find their way, now they know the way. Teenagers who couldn't communicate, now they can communicate. Teenagers who were lost, now they're found. Teenagers who helped themselves, now they can help others. Just learn some of these teenage stories. There's plenty around. If you're talking to single mothers, tell them the single mother's success stories. If Sarah can do it, you can do it. Come on. So it's a little difficult. So you've got opposition. What else is new? It's called the drama of the creator and the spoiler. Let's go. Let's go. See stories. Jesus was one of the great storytellers. To use him one more time. He had this gift. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like... He didn't say the kingdom of heaven was and then tried to describe it in some abstract terms. It's like a marriage. It's like a family. It's like you and me. It's like us. See, we could understand that. Something abstract. We couldn't understand that. But he said, it's like, and then tell a story. What a gift. It's like and tell a story. See, that's, that's being gifted. That's being, practicing the craft so well that you can do that. Next is borrowing, saying it well from someone else. Like the lyrics of a song, if somebody's written something that is so gifted in terms of its meaning and impact, you might as well use it. I talked about Zig Ziglar, right? Zig said, if you help enough people get what they want. I didn't say that. Zig said it. I borrow it. It's just as effective as to say, and Zig said it. I borrow the lyrics from songs, the message of someone else. Because some people have said it so well, you couldn't have, have thought of it in a million years. Winston Churchill said, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it and ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. See, you could stay up all night and not think of that. <laughs> so why not be a good student of good ideas, a good student of things well said, a good student of just one or two lines that's meaningful to a teenager that says, wow, now I see what you're talking about. Just borrow, borrow, use, use. Here's the next one. Straight talk. Tell it like it is. I'm sure these days everybody's ready to accept this. No nonsense, tell it like it is, straight talk. This is not belligerent talk now. This is just straight talk. No nonsense. This is how it really is. There's no use sugarcoating it. There's no use trying to glamorize it. You know, some people are into affirmations to glamorize something, but we don't need that. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. What if that's not the truth? Would you keep saying it and saying it and saying it? No. Here's the best affirmation. The truth. I'm working on disciplines every day that's making me better and better. See, now, that affirmation is the truth. If that is the truth. Straight talk. Affirmation without discipline is the beginning of delusion. Plenty is possible without being foolish. Here's the truth. We are the victim of our sins and our errors. Here's also the truth. You can turn it around in one day and head a brand new direction. And probably within a few weeks and maybe a few months, the early return will keep you on this track forever. And the fortune belongs to you. See, that's also the truth. 
The truth is we're victim of our errors. The truth also is you can turn it around overnight. You can't get there overnight, but you can turn it around overnight. And the answer is why not? The quicker you turn it around, the quicker the abundance belongs to you and the closer your fortune comes. And then you'll have the health and the breath and the vitality to do extraordinary things. If you start a new health program today, so you've messed up in the past. That's the truth. The truth also is today can be a brand new day. Pick a new destination. That's also the truth. The truth is revealing and inspiring. That's why we use it. That's why we don't use some tricky other stuff. The truth alone is enough. It sets you free. One, to correct old errors. Two, to set up easy disciplines that changes everything. That's what the truth is for. Here's what's next. To really help people in extraordinary ways, learn to deal in challenges. That's what sports is all about, challenge. That's what music is all about, the challenge to play so well someone's inspired. The challenge to say it so well, someone gets it. The challenge to be so gifted in language that somebody sees it. It's unbelievable. Insight is unbelievable. Only human beings can do this. Close your eyes. The man closes his eyes, puts his hand over his eyes, and he says, I see it. I see it. You say, no, you got your eyes closed. No. There's more than one way to see. And all somebody has to do is see an answer that they could start on immediately. And within six months, their whole life could start to multiply and change. Within one year, the difference would be extraordinary. And a person who was lost now becomes a person of influence just because somebody helped them to see for the moment what was wrong and the possibility to change it. And then, the challenge to go do it and do it well. Now, here's the best challenge of all. Let's go do it. Not always saying you go do it, you go do it. You change, you change, you go do it. Here's the best challenge. Let's go do it. Let's get healthy. Let's change the world. Let's build an enterprise. Let's work on this together. See, I always respond to this. Let's. Sometimes it's hard to lift yourself out. It's hard to be self-inspired at first. And if somebody says, come on, let's start a new program. Come on, let's do exercises. Come on, let's get healthy. Come on, let's start something. I'll be there, you be there, and you bring a guest and I'll bring a guest. Let's start something. That is so inspiring to have somebody say, let's, let's do it. Not always you do it, let's do it. Let's build a team. Let's win the championship. Let's walk off with the trophy. Let's. Wow, there's something about that that can keep you awake nights. There's something about that that turns on the juices. There's something about that that reaches deep in the soul for a person that can do extraordinary things when somebody says, let's, let's. I've got two with me already. If you'll be the next one, we can conquer the world. You say, whoa. Together, nobody's a match for us. By yourself, you're vulnerable. With us, nobody's a match. You say, wow, I want to belong to that team. So figure out ways to say let's. Next. An interesting subject now in wrapping up communication called tools of last resort. Here's my language, something you can use that can be highly effective, but we call it tools of last resort.
not to be used unless like there's no hope left. This is the only last chance. There's no other possible way. Then you reach in your bag of tools for the tools of last resort. So let me give you some of those. Number one is a direct attack. You, instead of using yourself as an example, using third party as an example, you go right after somebody. It's called a direct attack on the problem that's mixed in with the person. And you're trying to be delicate and careful, but they need to hear it direct. That you've got to be very careful of. Use every other means possible first before you go for the direct attack. Third party, use yourself, every illustration you can think of. But if finally that doesn't do it, finally, you may have to say you. But now you must do it very carefully and only as a tool of last resort. Here's another one. Sarcasm. Sarcasm is a useful communication tool, but you must be careful how you use it. Sarcasm says, who do you think you are? That's what God said to Job. Job was complaining. Oh, well, this and that and this and that. And God gave Job an unbelievable lesson. He says, where were you when I put the worlds in place? Where were you when I flung the stars into the heavens? Where were you? Hiding under a bush? I mean, this is sort of an ego trip for God, working on Job. A bit of sarcasm. But the time had come, and Job needed to hear it. There was no other recourse but to go right after him and say, hey. Sure enough, it turned around. Someone walks in late and you say, where have you been? Especially if it's an assembled group. You've got to be very careful of things like that. Where have you been? See, that's loaded with you don't care. That's loaded. So you've got to be careful with loaded statements, especially exposing something in, a, in an audience of people. Best to do those kind of things private. Get someone off to the side and say, hey, late one more time, and I'm telling you, you won't be welcome here anymore. But see, you can't. Just jump the gun here with sarcasm. Tools of what? last resort when there's no hope left and this is the only way. Here's the next one, scolding. You have to be very careful of scolding. Scolding sometimes as a last resort is, is very necessary, but you must be very careful. Scolding someone is like giving them a cut giving them a cut with your words, like on the hand, giving a cut. And maybe it'll serve its purses, uh, purpose, and the cut will heal, and everything will be okay. You needed to get their attention. Scolding. But you mustn't do it every day. All the time. Some children wind up with these psychic scars because they've been slashed and cut every day. Scold, slash, cut, scold every day, and they wind up psychologically uh, disadvantaged because of this kind of treatment. Somebody who has the words, words that are cruel, but they use them too often, too often, all the time, rather than saving it up for a tool of last resort. They just cut and slash all the time, and kids sometimes have a lot, hard time working out of this problem because of that kind of atmosphere. Too severe, we say, is too severe. In some countries, if you steal, they cut off your hand. That's a bit too severe, isn't it? A little too severe? Maybe a little piece of the finger, but not, not the whole hand. But guess what they say? It's very effective. <laughs> Say, did you ever steal anything else? Are you, are you kidding with just one hand? It's, no. So it is effective. But we would say what? Too severe. What do we say with someone that now has been convicted? They must not suffer what? Cruel and unusual. Cruel and unusual punishment. 
Hopefully we will continue to be a country that does not administer cruel and unusual punishment. Now, parents, let me talk to you about cruel and unusual punishment. You must be gifted in thinking of ways. Now, sometimes severity is needed, but only as a last, 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 last result. John Kennedy's father, old Joe, said this to John, and it'll serve in so many ways, and you'll see when I give it to you. Here's what old Joe Kennedy said. If it is not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. If it's not necessary to change, it's necessary not to change. So I'm sure you've got that message now. If it is not absolutely necessary to scold, then it's necessary not to scold. If it's not necessary to use sarcasm, then it's necessary in all the rest of your speech not to use sarcasm. If it's not necessary to use, it's necessary not to use. A mother who screams all day at her children. Finally, the kids get used to it. Mama just screams all day. Kids come over to visit, and they say, don't mind Mama, she's just a screamer. I mean, she just screams all day at everything, screams all day. So the kids are used to it. But now comes the big problem when the three-year-old child is headed for the street and a truck is coming and Mama screams, nobody pays any attention. See, Mama should have what? So jot this down now. Mama should save up her screams so that the day she does and it becomes a necessary tool of last resort, the day she screams, the world stops. <whistles> See, that's the key. Tools of what? Last resort. Last. Here's another one, temper. If it's not necessary to lose your temper, now sometimes it is. But if it's not necessary, then it is necessary not to lose your temper. Just hang on to that emotional explosion. Yes, you could explode all over somebody, but only as a last resort if it's called for. But not all the time. All of us have to contain ourselves. Here's the first law of a civilized society, the restraint of power and the restraint of the evil side of our nature. When a little three-year-old boy hits another three-year-old boy over the head, if he's not restrained, he will do it again. And if he's not further restrained, he will probably enjoy it. And we have the beginning of an uncivilized person. The first mark of civilization to be in a civilized society is the restraint of your emotion, the restraint of your words, the restraint of your power. That's the beginning of a civilized society. And so it is in civilized language. So it is in civilized communication. The restraint of being so powerful you blow somebody away or make a situation so impossible it'll never be cured. Effective but careful. Easy, powerful but easy. Speaking of Jesus one more time, it's so easy to use the Bible as almost an exclusive source of stories and illustrations. The record tells us, according to the storytellers, the record tells us that Jesus in three and a half years of his ministry only lost his cool just a few times. Just a few times. Not a few times a day. No. Just a few times in three and a half years. See, that's, that's the key. But when he did, beware. There's one scene where he drove him out of the temple, kicked over the money changer's table, screamed like a Comanche, grabbed a whip, and drove them all out of the place until it was empty. Everybody says, get out of here. He's on a rampage. Have you got it? But this is your notes now. Not every day. <laughs> so 
So I'm asking you, okay, the restraint of power, yes, you could use. Yes, you could empty the place. Yes, you could create unbelievable havoc and have some sort of satisfaction, but see only as a tool of last resort, whether it's the community or a company or a person or a child, right? Restraint of power. We must be careful with power. A father must be careful with power so that his children doesn't live in his shadow. A father must restrain to be a good father. Restrain. Yes, he could. Yes, he's capable. Yes, he can beat him half to death, but he must restrain, restrain, restrain. That's a civilized society. And the more powerful you are, the more careful you have to be. Hey, the elephant must be careful where he steps. You say, well, but this is a big, big, happy, friendly elephant. Yes, but the mouse is dead. <laughs> he didn't see him. He just went walking, and now the poor mouse is gone. He didn't mean to, but he's so big that he has to be careful where he steps. We've got powerful people in this room today. I'm asking you to be careful where you step, and be careful what you say, and be careful what you write. Be careful in conversation, wise but careful, strong but easy, and good communication belongs to you. Now, there's, here's, here's one more that is so unique. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. ready. You can't imagine how exciting it was for me to come and be here today. And then we got tomorrow and another day. Wow, this is heavyweight stuff for me chance to share ideas. Here's the last one now on communication. Then I got a few more things. No, we'll be finished. The more you care, the stronger you can be. See, that's the key. The more you care, the stronger you can be. Even children will allow you to really get on their case if they know you really care. If there's no doubt about your sincerity, if there's no doubt about your heart that breaks, when you have to cover something unpleasant. There's no doubt about that. And the more you care, the stronger you can be. And then if you're gonna be strong, you have to care. There are some conversations that you have with your children that don't make sense if you don't cry. If the tears don't flow, this conversation doesn't make sense. This is just belligerence. I don't mind a minister consigning my soul to hellfire for my sinful ways, as long as he does it with tears and not with joy. If you were gonna preach a sermon on hellfire, wouldn't you have to sob and cry? If you're gonna preach hellfire, you have to sob and cry. If dry-eyed you preach hellfire, everybody dismisses it as a performance. Unless your heart breaks, Unless the tears flow, you can't preach hellfire for an individual. It doesn't make sense. We dismiss it as ego. But if your heart breaks and the tears flow, you can cover some pretty heavyweight stuff and be so effective.